Very excited to have you all here today. And we are joined by Karen Jokala, who is our Farm Bill Pollinator Conservation Planner in Minnesota for the Xerces Society. All right, so thank you again so much for joining us today. We're so happy to have you here and I will pass it off to Karen. Thank you, Karen. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. And thanks to all of you for being here and um, Despite everything else that's going on in the world right now, I have to say building this presentation over the last few days has been such a lovely distraction for me. And um, I invite you into my distraction now, hopefully um, inspiring you to not just have this be a temporary distraction, but also something that encourages you to go forth and kind of build the community and the environment that you you want to see and you want to live in. So thank you again for being here. Um, I am locked. Let's see here. <laughs> um, Rachel, I, there we go. Perfect. All right. Well, I have to acknowledge first that this is a collective kind of project that we're working on here with Xerces. Um, we're a member-based organization, kind of like public radio. We don't work in isolation. We have a lot of people supporting us, foundations, organizations, businesses. Um, this is collective work, and we invite you to be part of that. For those of you who are new to the Xerces Society, we are a nonprofit wildlife conservation organization that works to protect invertebrates and their habitats. We take our name from the Xerces Blue Butterfly, this butterfly up here on the right. It's a the first butterfly to go extinct due to human influenced habitat loss or that we we're based in Portland, Oregon, but we have staff all over the country. I'm based in southeastern Minnesota and I uh, work across Minnesota and in Wisconsin. Our organization has several programs. There's the pollinator and agricultural biodiversity program that's our our largest program, uh, the program for which I work, and I largely work with farmers. Uh, we also have a really amazing endangered species team that works on a diversity of species ranging from freshwater mussels, some of our most imperiled invertebrates in the, in the continent, um, firefly conservation, monarchs, bumblebee conservation. We have a growing urban conservation program. Um, we have something called Bee City and Bee Campus USA, which I'll describe here. The mission of Bee City USA is to galvanize communities to sustain native pollinators. Um, so that means building habitat, protecting that habitat from pesticides, and then celebrating your work as a community. And the mission of Bee, or Bee City is actually, um, has two kind of sister, uh, initiatives within the Bee City USA um, program, and that's Bee City USA as well as Bee Campus USA. So Bee City is kind of for municipalities like cities, towns, even counties. Um, and Bee Campus USA right now is for university campuses and college campuses, not at this point, um, not like high school campuses and so forth. If you'd like to learn more about Bee City USA and Bee Campus USA, I highly encourage you go to the, our website, but also um, go to our YouTube channel to learn more about what the, the program is, how you can get involved and how you might become an affiliate. As you can see, we have a lot of affiliates in the Great Lakes region, um, some cities, some campuses. We have more coming online just about every week. So now to get into the kind of the meat of this presentation, I always like to start at this really high level to, to give you some perspective about the importance of invertebrates. And so I like to start here and really put forth this tenet that invertebrate conservation is a priority. So when you think about the diversity of life on this planet and of the species that are described, um, we have over 2 million species that are still counting, obviously. Um, of those 2 million species, about 70% of those are invertebrates or 1.5 million species. And if you just kind of hone in on the kingdom Animalia, 95% uh, of the biodiversity in the kingdom Animalia is represented by invertebrates. 
So when a lot of us think about wildlife conservation, we think about things with a backbone, like a frog or a bird or a cheetah. Um, but I really wanted to give you this perspective so that when you start to think about wildlife conservation, you start to conjure up images of invertebrates, these insects that really dominate the diversity of life on this planet. And because uh, the fate of the world's insects is truly inseparable from our own fate in, as humans. <laughs> if you care about soil health or pest control or really any kind of ecological function, uh, if you care about, care about diverse food, uh, we need to start caring about insect conservation and diversity. These are animals that um, are cycling nutrients, they're offering free pest control services, they're turning plants into food for other animals. So insects that consume um, trees or vegetative matter um, turn their bodies into little protein packages for other wildlife. And then of course they do a really important thing which is help plants reproduce um, or they pollinate. So why focus on pollinator habitat in particular? So this is the beginning of kind of a a three-part uh, part of the presentation. So I want to talk about the why of pollinator habitat, uh, and then the what of pollinator, pollinator habitat, and then the how. So this is kind of the why. Why should we even be doing this? One, uh, pollinators are ecological keystone species. So more than 85% of flowering plants require an animal. Usually that animal is an insect, and usually that insect is a bee for pollination. So our ecosystems on this planet would be fundamentally altered without these animals in them. One, another reason is that without these pollinators, we wouldn't have the pollination service. And that pollination service results in essential food for wildlife. So fruits, seeds, nuts, it enables reproduction of these plants. Um, and you might think of a bird eating berries or something, but I thought it was interesting to note that this year uh, a study came out of northern Minnesota where they discovered that even top predators like wolves can really rely on these pollination services in different parts of the season. So in July, 83% of the diet of wolf packs was actually wild blueberries. Uh, so even these top predators are relying on the smallest little insects um, to stabilize their ecosystem. Three, when we create pollinator habitat, we're bringing a lot of other insects along, a lot of other wildlife along um, for the ride. So pollinator habitat can also create habitat for natural pests, um, natural enemies that might eat pest insects. Sorry, natural and not natural pests, but natural enemies that would eat pests. Um, they're using these flowers for different parts of their life cycle as well. And some of these beneficial insects are actually doing the pollination themselves. So in these three pictures, not a single animal here is a bee. These are all beneficial insects, either flies or wasps, that are obviously coming to the flowers for the pollen or nectar there. Um, they're doing some pollination, but at another part of their life cycle, maybe the larval stage, they're voracious predators of aphids or um, caterpillars. So they're doing kind of double duty in our... Fourth reason, human nutrition. I don't know about you, but I really like a colorful diet. I like to include all these different fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, coffee, chocolate in my diet. Um, and we could not have those kinds of foods without pollinators. Obviously, there are economic consequences for their pollination services as well. Um, these kinds of foods really drive our um, agricultural uh, economy as well. Uh, and another reason is to counteract this idea of the extinction of experience. And and this is something, this, this is a term that was coined by our founder, Robert Michael Pyle. And the idea is that we are losing a connection with nature. And that connection with nature um, is, enhances our public health. Without that connection of nature, we're reducing our affinity for nature, reducing our capacity for future 
uh, conservation dollars and investment. Um, and the cool thing about building habitat is that insects are really one of the most accessible forms of wildlife that people can interact with. Uh, this is my own daughter, and I was introducing her to the idea of these these bumblebees that at the end of the season, they get really sleepy and cold and the males, they can't sting you anyway. And you can actually get up and, and pet them. I mean, you can get that close and have this intimate relationship um, with bees and other insects. Six, do it because it's trendy. I'm, I'm kidding, but kind of not. Um, in a national gardening survey in 2020, uh, we, discovered that actually a lot of people are already on board with building pollinator habitat. One in four American adults in the last three years bought a plant because it was beneficial to birds, bees, or butterflies. Uh, in 2019 alone, one in seven adults purchased a native plant or native plants. Um, and 9% of adults are converting part of their landscape um, to wildlife or natural wildflower habitat. That's really encouraging. Uh, seven, because do it because pollinators are in decline. And this isn't a pollinator decline kind of webinar. I wanna keep this kind of oriented towards solutions and I could give a whole talk on pollinator declines, but that is the last thing we need right now. <laughs> but it has to be noted that these invertebrates really are in decline. Um, they're at risk of extinction. 40% of invertebrate pollinator species globally are at risk of extinction. And some of these are even kind of formerly abundant species that now almost only exist in urban habitats. So uh, this is an example of the rusty patch bumblebee, uh, one of the first bumblebees in the United States to be listed as federally endangered. Uh, on the left is the former species range. So as you can see, kind of like the Great Lakes region, right? It used to be really common. And now it has seen an 87% range loss. And if you're familiar with the Great Lakes geography, you can kind of see on the right where those yellow and orange dots are. That's, that's the Minneapolis metropolitan area. That's Madison, Wisconsin. That's Chicago, where its stain is in kind of urban environments. It can be supported there. And the final reason, and there's so many other reasons I could list here, but I just want to keep it somewhat brief, is because we can. Like, this is not work like saving rhinos. This is stuff that's easy to do. We can um, all get involved. We can plant a few things and it can really have a significant impact for pollinators. So that's kind of the why. And now I wanna talk about the what. <laughs> so this might seem a little basic, but I wanna make sure we're all on the same page here about what we're really been talking about when we say, what is a pollinator? What kind of critters are we actually trying to build habitat for? I hear a lot of people say, I want to I want to grow some pollinators or I want to put in pollinators. And I'm wondering what they mean by that. So just look at these kinds of pictures. Which of these do you think might be a pollinator? Right, okay. So some of these are, many of them are pollinators. A pollinator is anything that helps move pollen from the male anther of a flower to the female stigma on a flower. So a lot of things can accomplish that. Um, butterflies, flies, moths of all kinds, wasps, beetles. These are the species that we typically think of as pollinators. Of course, like the lacewing and the assassin bug, these are really important beneficial insects that do visit flowers, although they rarely are actually transferring that pollen around. And I put in a picture of a hand pollinating a squash because yeah, Humans could be pollinators too, but I don't know, that's not the kind of future I want. Whenever I eat a squash, I don't want to be responsible for pollinating that squash flower. So I would rather have the bees and the pollinators do this for us. So that's just common language. That's what is a pollinator. Um, the reason bees get the most attention when we talk about pollinators is that they are the most efficient, therefore the most important pollinators. They're the most important for two primary reasons. One, that they are actively collecting and transporting pollen throughout, you know, as adults, they're bringing it to their, to their babies to eat the pollen and nectar. So if I were to go back here, some of these insects that I showed you, their larval stages don't eat pollen and nectar. And they eat, if it's a butterfly, they're caterpillars, right? They're eating vegetation. 
And instead, these bees are actually eating pollen and nectar at all stages of their life cycle. The other cool thing that bees do is that they exhibit floral constancy. So they're, they're kind of loyal to one species at a time. So for example, in the spring, a bee isn't going to visit a dandelion and then an apple blossom and then a willow. Instead, it's gonna go from an apple to an apple to an apple tree. And that from a plant's perspective is exactly what you want because if you're an apple flower, you really can't do anything with dandelion pollen. So that is why they are the most important and the most efficient pollinators and why they get the most attention. Bees are really, really diverse. Um, there's a lot going on in this slide, so I'll just kind of draw your eyes to a few different areas. The first is that circle in the center. So 3,600 bees. That's the number of bees we have in the United States. Uh, and there's so many different kinds, right? They all have different kinds of life history strategies. They, some of them are uh, nest in the ground, some of them nest in trees and in stems. Um, you'll notice some of them even parasitize each other, which is a really neat thing to go as a rabbit hole. I won't go down, but it's something to note. Um, you'll, I'm going to draw your attention to that red circle at the top. A lot of you, when you think about a bee, you might think of like a, a honeybee or even a bumblebee. That is really just a small sliver of the diversity of bees we have out there. And this is just another way to look at some of that diversity, right? So these bees have different morphology. This photo obviously is intended to show you different kinds of, of tongues they have, different lengths of tongue. Obviously this one in the center is, is a moth and you can see moths and butterflies have really long tongues. This is for working different kinds of flowers. Um, they're adapted to, different, to, to interact with flowers in different ways. This is another way to think about some of that bee diversity, you can see these bees are carrying pollen in different parts of their body. Some of them are carrying it on their tummy. Some of them are carrying it high up into their armpits, some down lower on their legs, kind of like chaps. Um, the color of the pollen is different. The, the quality of the pollen is different. So these bees are adapted to really different kinds of, of flowers, different times of the season. And this is just a small sampling of inflorescences in our environment. You can see there's this, this diversity of colors and shapes. They're blooming at different times of the year. Some of them we would consider um, like open access. So in that way, they're, they're offering their pollen and nectar resources right there on the surface, like the yarrow down on the bottom. Whereas others are holding tight their resources a little bit. Their, their pollen or their nectar is really hidden and it requires a very special kind of pollinator to get access to those, those riches, so to speak. So this diversity of bees brings forth the diversity of wildflowers and kind of is vice versa. And so bees need not just flowers, but they also have this variety of, of nesting behaviors. You could roughly think about the diversity of our bees broken down into three different categories. We have our, our bumblebees, kind of our, our one social, truly social native bee. Um, they kind of nest in a whole variety of different places. Mm -hmm. And then we have the majority of our bees are ground nesting bees. They're solitary bees. They, it's one mother bee digging out a nest and um, managing her own little just, for, just herself and her young. And then about 30% of our bees are what we call stem nesting bees or tunnel nesting. They sometimes nest in an old cavity of a beetle borer, that kind of thing. This is uh, just some illustrations of what that might look like for these different kinds of nesting behaviors. Uh, they could be in the ground, they could be in old decaying wood. Some of them use particular vegetation types. Like you can see in the center there, these plants that kind of look like they have punch holes in them. They've used a little bit of leaf tissue to make uh, partitions in their cells. Some of the ground nesting bees are nesting anywhere from a couple centimeters down below ground all the way to, you know, a, a foot or two down below the surface. Just, I thought I would go over the, the life cycle of a solitary bee so you can kind of imagine what this um, bee is and what it's habitat needs or protection needs might be throughout the year. 
So taking the mining bee as an example, it might be flying in the spring, gathering pollen and nectar from a particular kind of flower, whether it's just a genus of flowers or a whole family of flowers, they're usually somewhat specialized. They are gathering pollen, depositing it in this little underground chamber or some kind of chamber in a stem. They're uh, depositing that nectar and pollen after many, many trips, laying an egg. Eventually the egg hatches and the larva starts to eat that pollen. And once it gets big enough, it eventually pupates underground. And whenever it's done pupating, usually typically a year cycle, uh, it will emerge from the ground or emerge from its cell and come, come out and do the whole thing again, right? So what's worth pointing out here is that when we think about building habitat, all of us visualize flowers, right? And they obviously need the flower resource throughout their life cycle, but they also need nest protection. Most of their life cycle is in that nest. So that they need protection from disturbance during that part of their life as well. The bumblebee life cycle, I thought I'd point out since we do have endangered bumblebees in the Great Lakes, um, it's a little bit different. And I'll start maybe at the top where we are approximately now where they have, we have some hibernating um, mated queens underground. In the spring when they emerge, she will fly around and start to look for her net, for a place to nest. When she finds a place to nest, she'll lay some eggs and usually those will be worker females to grow the colony. Eventually later in the summer uh, at the colony's peak, she'll start to lay eggs for males and new queens. And in the fall, those males and new queens will leave their nest, mate. Um, and during that time, the rest of the colony kind of falls away. They, they, they die. And what you have left is these newly mated queens. And so what's worth pointing out in this life cycle is that um, there are some vulnerable points for bumblebee conservation, right? The mated queens during the fall and the spring are sort of vulnerable. So they need, what's really essential here is that they need high quality and abundant spring resources for building up their colony. And in the fall, they need really high quality resources to build up their fat reserves to make sure that they get through the winter um, and come out strong in the spring. And for those of you who maybe aren't as keen to attract a bunch of bees to your yard, um, I know some of you are more interested in attracting something like butterflies. <laughs> they seem a little bit more innocuous. <laughs> um, and it's worth pointing out some of their life history too. So um, butterflies will lay an egg on vegetation, usually that a vegetation is a very specific type. So the classic example is monarchs that they uh, require milkweed plants for their larvae, their caterpillars to grow on. And a lot of butterflies have unique um, vegetation requirements as well. So both as the, at the caterpillar stage, they might need a specific kind of plant. And then as they emerge as adults, they usually need a lot of nectar resources. Some of them, they're usually not as picky, uh, but they do have preferences. Um, so I'm, if you are interested in learning more about some of those relationships between the types of uh, butterflies you're trying to attract and how that might impact um, gardening choices, I encourage you to look at our Gardening for Butterflies book. Okay, so we're still in the what. So what does pollinator habitat look like? And I want to encourage you to think beyond just like a, a wildflower meadow when you're thinking about designing pollinator habitat. I want you to think about all kinds of different plant communities, woodlands, wetlands, uh, prairie types, environments. These are all can support uh, pollinators. So diversity is really the key here. And when you plant diversity in and among um, your community, you will have see all these other impacts. It obviously increases biodiversity and functionality for wildlife, but it also increases your soil health, it increases uh, water quality by um, improving infiltration. It uh, native plant communities that are diverse are higher, more resistant to plant invasion. They are more climate ready uh, for extreme weather events, and they kind of stand the test of time. They they increase your longevity to planting. 
um, if you include diversity from the beginning. Pollinator habitat, like I said, is not just flowers. All of these different types of plant functional groups can really contribute to pollinator conservation, whether it's uh, a host plant that they're feeding on, like grasses and sedges. This could be butterfly host plants, um, but grasses and sedges can also be important nesting habitat for, for bees. Uh, a variety of flowers, wildflowers and forbs can be useful. Um, and including as many of these different functional groups in your planting as possible can really increase the overall functionality of your, of your planting. Obviously, when we're planting for pollinators, we need abundant flowers. Um, we need flowers from early spring all the way into late fall for some of those bees that are actually flying that entire time. But other bees are only flying for a couple weeks at a time during the year and they when they start to fly they need the resources to be available when they're out so things from early season to all the way to the fall um, and when you're selecting plants you also want to be mindful of selecting from different plant families uh, different plant families host a variety of different uh, pollen specialists or generalists. Uh, when we include more plant families in our uh, plantings, we actually invite more diversity of pollinators to the table, right? So right here I have represented asters, legumes, and willows. These are kind of our heavy hitter plant families in the Great Lakes area for hosting a, a broad diversity of insects, so like picky eaters, They're, they'll only go to plants in that family. But I also wanted to point out as an example, um, native loose stripes, so Lysimachia species. This is a species that tend to, they're actually really common in, um, in natural areas in the Great Lakes, fringed loose, fringed loose stripe. And I bring it up because it hosts this kind of rare bee, Macropus ciliata, um, that these bees actually collect floral oils from native loose stripes, and they need that to line the nests of the, um, the, the young that they're provisioning for. And so when we don't include uh, native loose stripes in our plantings, we never invite that type of bee to our community. Um, so there are a lot of different plant families that host specialists. A lot of the spring ephemerals do just something to consider. And if you are really interested in this idea of planting for specialist bees, these are a couple key resources to check out. They're really thorough, research-based. Um, I will look through those. So with those central tenets, I just want to put up a couple of photos of different landscapes and try to look at it from the bees perspective, right? So this is a pretty semi-natural woodland area. I think it's part of an arboretum actually, but um, you can see like all these different plant functional groups are playing important roles for pollinators. It has these woody perennial species of different heights. So there's large uh, canopy trees, but there's also different kinds of shrubs that are blooming at different times. Um, there's an abundance of spring ephemerals. I can't find it in the photo, but I would hazard to guess that there's probably a lot of sedges in the understory as well. And if you want to look at this and try to mimic this in your own residential landscape, I would suggest selecting the woody species that you want to include first and then design your other kind of herbaceous layer around that. This is a little bit more manicured example, but um, this is an example from a campus, University of Minnesota campus, uh, a native planting. And you can see it has these different plant functional groups in the planting. There's grasses, there's a couple different wildflowers. One of them is a host plant for monarchs. Um, there's some woody species in here. And I just wanna encourage you to not skimp on grasses. They can be really important habitat for butterflies, for bumblebees, overwintering habitat. This is um, an example of prairie drop seeds. This is the side view. I took this picture kind of on a slope so I could look straight sideways at the prairie drop seed. And a lot of bunch grasses do this. You can see that they, over time, from year to year, they leave this kind of leaf litter below. 
And that is prime bumblebee habitat down there for them to build a little bumblebee colony down there for refuge over the winter. I mean, grasses should not be forgotten in your habitat plantings. This is another example from a community library project in Minnesota. This is kind of a, a depression around the landscaping of the library and the storm water went fed directly into their storm drain that went really quickly into their river nearby. And they wanted to improve the water quality before it got to the river. So they did this native planting. And you can see just in this small snapshot already at least four species blooming during the middle of the summer. And of those four species, there's at least four different plant families represented here. And each plant family is going to attract different kinds of wildlife to the planting. This is another kind of view shifted a little bit of the same site. Um, and you can see there's a lot of different kinds of grasses and sedges, um, some woody habitat that's providing flowering flowers as well as probably nest sites. Um, so this is what it can look like. I'm trying to kind of expand your notion of, of pollinator habitat in different environments. Um, the question of what should I plant often comes up and because this Great Lakes region is so large, I invite you to go to the Xerces Pollinator Conservation Resource Center to find some of the lists of species that we would recommend. Um, but there's so many great resources out there that the first thing I would really encourage you to, to focus on is to put in native perennial plants. Those will those will kind of have the most bang for your buck um, and create the, uh, the highest conservation value for you. Um, and then select species that are known to have high pollinator value. Make sure you're choosing species that are appropriate for your site conditions like soil drainage and light. Um, obviously budget always comes into planting projects. So make sure you're choosing species that are pesticide free. So a lot of nurseries will sometimes use um, pesticides for cosmetic purposes. So it's important to ask nurseries where you're sourcing plants, um, what has been used on the plants that might be detrimental for pollinators down the road. There are a lot of different ways to explore different plant species. Um, check out your, your own state's Department of Natural Resource lists. Uh, I encourage you to look at the Prairie Moon Nursery catalog, not as an endorsement for that business over other businesses, but only that they have this really exhaustive library of hundreds of North American native species there. Um, so it's really worth kind of exploring that and filtering and figuring out um, a couple of species to choose. Okay, so this kind of wraps up the, the what of pollinator habitat, right? We've identified that there are a few basic requirements for all pollinators. They need diverse vegetation, they need season-long nectar and pollen. They need host plants. They need shelter for their nesting as well as for overwintering. And then uh, they definitely need refuge from pesticides. So whatever projects you're planning, make sure that you are protecting that new project from uh, pesticide contamination. There's so many different cosmetic reasons for using pesticides in, in urban areas um, that should be discouraged, but in general, make sure whatever new plantings you're putting in is protected. Okay, so now comes kind of the fun part. This is like the, the virtual garden tour part of the webinar where we get to see how this can look in a city. Um, so I, I really wanna underline that when you build it, the invertebrates will come. Everything from community gardens to small urban wastelands can support diverse pollinators. Um, and if they're well managed, they can do as good of a job as natural areas. So it's worth um, doing this. I wanna go through a couple, kind of go through scenarios starting at like the home garden scale and then kind of scaling up throughout the city and going through different kinds of um, places in your urban environment where pollinator habitat can be enhanced. Um, and then I also want to encourage you to do some other um, kinds of organizing and get involved in other projects, and whether that's because you have converted your entire property to pollinator habitat or because 
um, you don't have property to enhance, there's ways that we can still be kind of expanding um, our overall conservation in cities. So I'll start with this. This is kind of a framework for how you start a project. This comes from uh, a new guide from Minnesota, Planting for Pollinators, Principles and Design for Residential Pollinator Habitat. Um, and this is how we would like to think about it. So you would want to prioritize these four different um, elements, right? Whatever planting you're putting in has a very low uh, or no pesticide risks, right? Where you're putting habitat kind of matters. So think about its connection to other habitats in the area. When you put in habitat, prioritize plant diversity in your planting. Um, what kind of water do you have on site to get the plants established? And then for certain kinds of invertebrates, they actually need access to a clean water source. Um, then you have to kind of think about your design decisions. How big do you want to make it? Uh, what kinds of pollinators are you trying to attract? Are you trying to attract those generalists or some specialists? Um, what are the general aesthetics? Um, always prioritize bloom throughout the seasons for for pollinators, but then there's this aesthetic side of that as well. Um, and then think long term, think about how this fits into kind of your, um, your timeline, how much maintenance is going to be required in years one to three or 10. Um, what's that overall habitat value that you're trying to create? What kind of outreach do you want to do around this? Do you want to put up signs, interpretive signs? Do you want to do garden tours? Um, what's the just the long term kind of lifespan of this project? This is um, just the, the beginning of the framework. I encourage you to go look at that uh, guide to, to learn more about this step by step process, but this is just a beginning. So the first thing I would recommend from like a homeowner scale, um, and then we'll expand outward, is to convert these abundant lawns we have everywhere, turf everywhere, to something anything <laughs> more useful. Um, it can be ideally native perennial or herbaceous plants. Um, it could be native trees and shrubs. It could be something edible um, for like fruit or vegetables or herbs. A lot of those have pollinator benefit as well, in addition to obviously benefiting us. Um, or you could, if you are going to maintain some lawn, try to include more flowers in the lawn itself. So I can totally recognize that lawns have some some value to us, right? Like in this picture, it's a, a lawn is a site for a campsite or a lawn is a place to have a picnic. A lawn is a place um, to play soccer. So that, I'm not suggesting that we need to get rid of all lawns, but we don't need as many of them. And we could do a lot um, more creative things with our, our lawn spaces. Uh, there's an, a new effort underway, which I think is really neat um, called the Homegrown National Park. Right now we have 40 million acres of lawn in the United States. And if we converted half of those, we could create what we think of as this, uh, another national park in the United States, but it's all in our backyards, which is a really fun, fun idea. Uh, so you could go all out like this friend of mine, Julia Venata, a Wild Ones member in Minneapolis. She has converted her entire uh, lot to native pollinator or native habitat plantings. This is a picture from, I think it's mid-July, and then this is another picture from mid-August um, from a slightly different angle. And this abundant white flowering vine is clematis. Um, it supports many, many different pollinators and beneficial insects. And it's obviously aggressive. Sometimes you want aggressive species, sometimes you don't. Um, that's one example. This is another example from a friend of mine, Vicki Bonk from the Wild Ones in Minneapolis. Her front yard is kind of, um, has some shade. And so she's using a variety of different spring ephemerals to create different textures and um, abundant wildflowers. Clearly she has all these different signs, interpretive signs to help people understand what it is she's trying to accomplish here. Um, and so that people can learn when they're walking by. Um, another thing to note is that she has kind of this uneven rock wall in there. Um, you can kind of see it underneath the plants. That's actually really great nesting habitat as well. 
you could convert the part of your lawn to just something edible, like uh, a small urban orchard. These are uh, really good resources for a lot of native bees in the spring to use uh, pollen and nectar from apples, from pears, from cherries, uh, blueberries. Uh, that's a great way to convert lawn to something more useful. And when you're doing these projects, remember to think about, remember that lifespan of it. What does it look like year round? Um, this is the yard of my friend Leslie Pilgrim, another Wild Ones member. Um, and this is in the summer for her lawn, or part of her lawn is converted to native. And in the winter, this is what it looks like. And because it's a little untraditional, a lot of, a lot of people like to tidy up their gardens, um, she provided an interpretive sign. And the text is a little small, so I'll read it. She says, Shh, native or nesting insects. We left last year's leaves and 15 inches of plant stems to provide important nesting habitat for insects and bees. So she's helping explain why her yard looks a little different than the conventional kind of landscaping. And if you need some, some fodder to help explain why you might be leaving the leaves, why you might be keeping some untidy spaces in your yard. Xerxes has developed some really effective um, social media campaigns around this. Leaves are not litter, leaves leave the leaves. Um, you can turn these into signs, you can share these on social media, um, find leave the leaves tag on different social media sites. And even if you're not converting part of your lawn to native perennial habitat, you can still do a lot with the lawn itself by allowing things to, to bloom and adding different species, forb species that tolerate some mowing that can be allowed to bloom. Um, dandelions, some clovers, self-heal, violets, um, even creeping thyme can be put in on dry sites. Um, this is a site on the left, which just had this accidental huge pollination of self-heal in the, in the front yard. It was beautiful. Um, and then of course, because you're intentionally trying to draw in pollinators, you wanna protect that lawn from pesticides. And this is not just, obviously I'm showing some pictures of um, residential lawns, but this uh, can be applied to parks and other landscapes. There's so many lawns in our urban environment. Bee lawns can really offer significant habitat. Imagine if all of the lawns and turf we had in our environment looked like this. That would go a long way to supporting um, a, a lot more pollinators in, in, our, in our environment. And finally, um, whatever projects you're doing, I really can't say this enough, providing signs, whether you make them yourself or um, or finding purchasing something online, this is a really great way to engage people around you, um, to help explain what you're trying to do, show that it's intentional, um, explain the value of pollinators. It's kind of just a, a little bait for a conversation starter, right? And it invites you to collaborate on bigger projects. So this is really fun to see different kinds of pollinator signs that show up. So now I wanna start expanding beyond the privately owned lot and start thinking about broader landscape habitat projects. So starting from that uh, private lot and thinking about the, the ways that they connect to other lots, um, I wanna show a few examples of boulevards and how they can connect habitat. These are just a few um, in and around Minneapolis. Here's one in St. Paul where you can see, this is the same kind of view down the street, the, the midsummer view, and then how that plant community kind of looks a little different in the fall. Some new colors come out. There's still things blooming late in the fall. And it's really, really beautiful. Um, they can be really short habitats. You know, one thing that strikes me about, especially this photo on the right, there's just so much concrete in our environment. And can you imagine from a pollinator's perspective how, what a breath of fresh air it might be to find this little colorful planting area um, where you can nest, you can find abundant resources. Um, these are just so fun. <laughs> uh, 
And then the last boulevard uh, photos I wanted to show you here. One, the one on the left here is just outside of a, a, a gas station, right? So obviously the gas station is not um, in charge of this project. This is a, a residential homeowner that lives in the community that is taking charge of this space that wasn't being used and trying to improve it um, to improve the, the pollinator habitat, the connectivity, the educational opportunities, just beautify the, the landscape around their community. Um, the photo in the center I wanted to point out because you can see there's some Jacob's ladder growing alongside dandelions. These are native plants that are volunteering in the sidewalk cracks, right? So one thing that is kind of a mind bender. So have you ever been on a trail and you notice there's a lot of uh, invasive species along the sides, or even on roadsides, right? A lot of roadsides around where I live, there's tons of invasive species. And that's because seeds travel in corridors, right? So what if we had all of these native plants in our corridors, and when we bring them along on our in our muddy boots or on our wheels, we're actually carrying along uh, native seeds to go replant everywhere instead of invasive species, right? So boulevards can really have a cool uh, corridor habitat impact. Okay, so there are other things you can do on sidewalks um, to not only benefit po pollinators, but also capture runoff and re have kind of these multifunctional benefits, right, of cleaning water bike trails along the same lines of that corridor um, kind of argument. Trails provide uh, long linear kinds of habitat corridors. They provide opportunities for education. Often there's a mix of different types of habitat. So you might have your uh, flowers where the bees and pollinators are going to forage, but that might be near a wooded edge where they might be using sort of nesting resources. Um, so bike trails are another great um, place. I mean, what I'm trying to get you to do is like think about your own community and the different elements in your community and where you could plug in, whether or not you have a yard. These are all people who are just engaged citizens in their community and getting involved and taking ownership of these public spaces. Roadsides, again, along the whole theme of corridors being important habitat, Roadsides can do multiple things. They can um, provide pollinator habitat as well as um, provide other benefits of water infiltration and, and so forth. Utility quarters, again, um, we have these in our environments, right? It just takes an engaged citizen to come and like take ownership of it and improve these spaces. Um, Usually they can be really great for low growing grasses, wildflowers, shrubs that don't require a lot of maintenance. Um, and then I want to talk about involving schools and other um, community organizations in this effort. So it's not just a private uh, homeowner here, private homeowner there. This is like a community effort here. So this is a school that I stumbled upon, an elementary school in Owatonna, Minnesota. Obviously, I was there at the wrong time of year because nothing was in bloom yet, but they made this beautiful little space in front of their elementary school where they brought in, they incorporated different curriculum elements of engineering, of art. They made this space where they could gather and do outdoor kinds of classroom exercises. You can see the, the bottom photo, there's like a wood around it and on this fence, there were all these beautiful pictures that the students drew and created collages. I mean, I, I think I took a picture of every single uh, post here and it was really challenging to choose the four to, to highlight here. But can you just imagine these kids spending all this time concentrating on these bees or these butterflies or these particular flowers, trying to illustrate them and those will be imprinted in their minds. You know, this is important space for them to observe the world around them and to start kind of being part of their, the knowledge that's important to them. So anyway, schools are a really great landscape to get involved. Um, public institutions offer a lot of education opportunities. So a library, you know, this is where people come 
to get knowledge, right? Uh, and so why does that have to just be inside the walls of that institution? Come and learn about the native landscape that surrounds this library, put some interpretive signs. Um, this is a really well done library uh, habitat installation. Um, some, some of us have wet areas around our, envir our built environments. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of those wet areas are crowded out by invasive species like reed canary grass. Um, and, and that can be a really great opportunity to put in woody species because woody species can, once they mature a little bit, can be um, more aggressive competitors against a competitive grass like reed canary grass. So that can be an opportunity to put in willows or some of the steeple bush species, elderberries, um, button bush, dogwood. This is just a short list. There's so many different um, species that could be good options here. And even when, even when you can't, or even when you can and you want to do more, um, it's important to not just plant the habitat, but then also engage with that habitat. So participate in volunteer efforts to maintain the habitat, participate in efforts to do community science around bumblebee surveys. Um, the Xerces Society has a really popular um, and productive community science project called Bumblebee Watch. It's easy to use, it's fun. You can do it individually or as a group. Um, all it takes is you with a camera. It can be a phone camera. You don't have to be a special uh, professional. You just take a picture of a bee upload it into Bumblebee Watch, and it will help you walk through some identification tips, and then a, an expert will, will verify your sighting. So it looks a little bit like this. Um, it helps you, like I said, through these different images, helps you narrow down some of the identification on your own, um, but then the experts come along eventually and verify to say, yes, it is that species or no, it isn't. And this contributes to really important data sets. So this is information that feeds into US Fish and Wildlife information about which species are declining, which ones are growing um, in terms of their range, which species might we consider for listing for endangered species. Um, and there's just a really a lot of valuable information that comes from this. And so obviously you can see it's very popular. It's being used across the continent um, and you should use it too. Okay. So there are so many other benefits of finding a community to be involved in. This is just a small sampling of initiatives and organizations that you are examples of um, places you could connect in, within the Great Lakes. So kind of bumblebee surveys or talk to your local extension office about how you can tap in. Um, find a master naturalist group, wild ones, native plant societies. These are all ways for you to grow in your learning and to find a group of people who keep you motivated and um, just to find some community in doing this work, right? Um, you can also try to pass local policies by getting engaged with your uh, local parks department or getting to know a city council member, um, writing an op-ed, maybe speaking at uh, public meetings. This is an example of some public policy work that really had a huge impact in Minnesota recently. In 2019, uh, our legislature passed a $900,000 um, initiative called Lawn to Legumes. And this is essentially a, a cost share funding opportunity to install small kind of pollinator friendly plantings in residential lawns. So converting lawn to little pocket prairies or pollinator habitat projects um, or creating bee lawns. Um, there are different ways that this money has been funneled to individual grants for private homeowners, but also to uh, groups have, who have organized in certain neighborhoods to create like demonstration neighborhoods so that they eventually could be used for outreach and education. It's just a really cool model. And if this is something that inspires you, I encourage you to look it up so that maybe you can bring this forward to, in your state um, and put a little pressure, peer pressure on your states to do something like this. Um, and then finally, celebrate. Make this kind of part of our, our ritual of 
um, what we care about. We care about organizing and celebrating the biodiversity that supports us, right? Make it fun. Um, these are just a couple of events that I'm gonna highlight from Minnesota. Uh, Pollination Fest that we have every year. It brings together all these different music and bands and food and um, super fun event, advocacy groups. Um, this is another one, the Monarch Festival, in which we kind of broadly celebrate migrations in general, um, which is there's lots of live music and it's, it's really a beautiful event. There's um, a few different artists up and we do, and everybody can do like a free kind of screen print. This is examples of some artwork that was drying up on the upper left there. Um, the prints that you could take home uh, say, make friends with pollinators. And <laughs> I mean, there were lines with like 50 people in them to get one of these to take home. It's super fun. Um, it's just really kind of making our, reinforcing what our culture is, right? We are a culture, we are a community that values pollinators and the environment that supports pollinators. So if you, don't have a lawn or if, if your gift is is as an artist, you know, maybe consider getting involved in this way, connect people to the plants and the pollinators and the place that you live. And these are all things that kind of give positive feedback to the whole project. And finally, do this work to build connections. And I know this this quote has been used so many times, but it's it's no less meaningful and true is that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can really change the world. Um, and so go forth, be inspired to, to make that change in your community. You have the all winter to start planning it. <laughs> um, so from there, I know you probably have lots of questions. Um, we have so many resources on our website that are pretty much all free downloadable PDFs that you can take and distribute in your communities. Um, resources that help you figure out the technical side of how to actually install these plantings, which species should I choose, that kind of thing. Uh, one resource that I highlight is this new guide, habitat assessment guide for, for pollinators and yards gardens and parks. This helps you strategically think about what habitat already exists in your environment and then what the deficiencies are so that you can strategically um, put your, your dollars and your time into improvements that are really going to fill gaps. So consider looking into that one. Um, we have lots of books available that you can purchase. Um, yeah, especially the gardening for butterflies one is a key one for this particular topic. Um, go to our YouTube channel. This webinar is part of a series uh, that will be kind of replicated throughout the United States so that each region is a little bit tailored. Um, we have a few of them that have already been posted on our YouTube channel. There's, like I said before, there's really great webinars about Bee City USA and Bee Campus USA, how to get involved in that. Uh, we are posting regularly on social media, so you can constantly be learning. Just as you're doom scrolling, you can actually find some things about, about beneficial pollinators while, you know, in your news feed. So um, engage that way. Uh, and spread the word. Remember that we are a member-based organization, and when you donate, you will receive one of these pollinator habitat signs. So, if it were me, that would be a really big incentive for me because I wanted one of those pollinator habitat signs. So that's um, if that's what it takes for you, <laughs> consider becoming a member. And then just thank you. This is my a picture of my in-laws and I help them install a prairie uh, pollinator habitat in their backyard uh, so that when my daughter goes over there to visit, um, she is exposed to all these different plants and all the insects that it, it um, brings forward. So anyway, that's all I have for you. I'm happy to answer some questions. Um, hopefully this was a helpful distraction from everything else and hopefully it helps you feel empowered and excited about going forward and do more, doing more in your communities. So thank you. 
Thank you so much, Karen. I know we're right at um, on the hour. So if you need to leave, thank you so much for, for joining us. And like I said, we will have this on YouTube so you can send it to your friends and recommend it. We just have a couple questions, mostly just comments about how great your presentation is. Um, and thank you for inspiration as well. Um, I answered a couple questions, but I thought I would ask you as well. One person asked about um, larval host plants. There was a particular link that you shared and they were asking me for the link and I wasn't sure which one they were um, referring to, if it was the monarch nectar, nectar list. So that's what I sent them. Okay. Well, there's monarch, ne so nectar plants, um, we have some of those resources listed as well um, on our website. So those are some links that I might have provided. Um, there are a number of resources that I could list. One of them might be to actually, I didn't list this, but I would suggest you go forward with this is to try to Doug Tallamy's work, um, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y. And he has really great resources on his website about which plant, native plants in your area support the most um, butterflies and moth species. So it's kind of a way of figuring out host plants for different um, species in your area. The, the gardening for pollinate or gardening for butterflies book helps figure out those butterfly and host plant relationships for the larvae. So what the caterpillars are actually feeding on. So if it's a fritillary, it might be um, violets um, or obviously there's milkweed for monarchs and so forth. And then there, the other thing that we talked about a little bit are these specialist bees and bees uh, poll are specialized on pollen. So they need specific kinds of pollen um, for, their, for their young. And those were sites from Jared Fowler. Um, and Rachel, if you want, I can go scroll back to those slides or, um, or somebody, we can talk offline with that person as well. Yeah, I think um, if they want to contact you, I think that would probably be best to send you an email because they'll know exactly which one it was just for time's sake. We also had someone ask about events and how you do community engagement during the time of COVID. <laughs> mm -hmm. A lot of organizations have moved events online or try to get individuals participating and in different activities in their own yard or neighborhood and then sharing it. Did you have any other ideas? It sounds like you have some really great resources in your local area. Yeah, I guess I would um, start locally. I mean, Xerces is this national organization that um, obviously do a lot of cool work, but one thing that we, we lack at this point is just a lot of manpower on the ground. So we really lean on partners uh, who are doing this work um, and really engaging at the real local level. Like we don't have, even though we're a membership-based organization, we don't have local chapters where we could have uh, community, me community members engaged in the work that we're promoting, right? So that's why I send people to organizations like Wild Ones or your Native Plant Society um, to get involved with people who are already doing this kind of work on the ground. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. I think it's, it's something everyone I think is struggling with right now. Um, someone had a quick question just about pesticide, if you could expand on whether that's an insecticide or an herbicide. Yeah, I use that term broadly because um, herbicide, because they, so pesticide is kind of an umbrella term. It can be um, insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, rodenticide, and like basically anything that kills a, a pest, right? And um, specifically herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides can all impact pollinators sort of in different ways. Um, herbicides obviously could impact pollinator habitat. So by reducing whatever plants that they're relying on, it could have, or yeah, so you, you could be killing plants that they need. Um, insecticides are frequently used on plants for cosmetic reasons to, they're usually it's, um, especially in urban environments, they're systemic insecticides. So basically 
a nursery would drench their their plant with this systemic insecticide that would then get taken up in all the leaf tissue, really in all the tissues of the vascular tissues of the plant so that insecticides are expressed in the nectar and the pollen, which makes it um, resistant to, to pests because any pest that comes to try to feed on that plant and damage it uh, would die, but then it also has either lethal or sublethal effects on the pollinators that visit those plants as well. Um, and so insecticides can have a lot of detrimental effects, obviously, on bees. Um, and then fungicides also act in some interesting ways. You wouldn't think fungicide is specifically supposed to target uh, fungi, right? Um, but a lot of, we're just learning this now, but a lot of our um, native bees, have, well, bees in general, just like us, have a microbiome. And uh, when bees somehow consume fungicides that are in our environment on plants, uh, that it can affect their microbiome and therefore de be detrimental to their health. We have a really great um, fact sheet on the impacts of fungicides to, um, to invertebrates and to pollinators. And one thing I didn't really highlight enough is that we have this amazing uh, pesticide team on at Xerces. They are extremely like research-based. They follow all the current science. Um, they have helped so many communities across the country um, create better pest management policies. Um, they, if you have any questions about pesticides in your environment or herbicides or insecticides, um, go to the website, try to figure out what resources we have in our publications library uh, about those kinds of things, but also our team members are just incredible people. <laughs> and I, I can't stress that enough. So um, that's a place to go. First, go to the website and try to explore what we have in the library. Thank you, Karen. We do also have, if you just want to learn about pesticide basics, I would say it's a lot more than just basics, but we have two webinars that we did back in April. Ah, pesticide, okay. And those are just on our YouTube channel and you can, you can find those. You'll learn more about pesticides probably than you ever wanted to, but <laughs> It's a really great overview on how it impacts different animals. So I think, yeah, I think those are great. Um, another question here about prepping and for planting. Um, this person is, sorry, I just lost it here. Prepping a garden when they're non-native invasive plants. So like creeping bellflowers, for example, what, what would mm. be your advice for them? Yeah. I I didn't go into the how as much um, because it can be kind of complicated and site specific, um, specifically with like particular weeds like that. Um, perennial weeds, like especially rhizominous weeds like that, that um, the creeping part, they are just, they can be really persistent underground for a long time, can take kind of a, you may have to take a long-term approach. There are some herbicides that could help um, but it may still be a long-term project, even if you, um, you might like smothering it, digging it out, um, but any little piece that's left over could still uh, persist and then grow from there. So um, weed management before putting in a planting can feel like it takes a long time, but it is so worth it <laughs> because once you invest the money to put in your native plants, it gets more challenging to weed out those invasives. So I think um, just really taking some time to prep your site, whether it's smothering wheat. Um, I, could, I could go back real quick. Um, let's see, maybe I can't. <laughs> anyway, our organic site prep guide um, has probably eight different methods and a whole chapter on each um, that you can find for free as a downloadable PDF on our website um, that gives eight different approaches for prepping a site prior to putting in or seed. Um, I would explore if it's a particular invasive species or noxious weed in your state. Your state might have some resources like your DOT might, what are effective um, approaches or techniques for getting rid of that species. Um, the Midwest Invasive Plant Network has some really great resources for control techniques for different invasives. Um, that would be another place to, 
to look into. Um, maybe I should pause there. I'm just putting in the chat um, our search engine and our website for all of the organic site prep resources. There's three different applications that folks can look at. So people are interested. So we just have one last question. Um, this person is in Canada and Toronto and they are mm -hmm. interested in Bee City. So I sent them a website for the Bee City Canada, which is awesome. Cool. Uh, they are specifically looking at developing a project that will allow students to plant in their own neighborhoods. And since everything is online right now, they were wondering if we had any resources or tools um, to include in a toolkit that they could send to students. The only thing I could think of was the, um, we have it on our website under for resources for teachers and students, but um, they're the scouting guides. I think mm. a good resource, but that's all I could come up with for now. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good launching pad. And I would also encourage like, um, iNaturalist, some of those apps where you can um, kind of explore what's in your environment and have like the global network help you identify what is in there, what is there. Mm -hmm. uh, those are, that's not like a form formula kind of teaching tool, but it can be helpful. Um, I don't know, it sounds like you probably answered that question better than me. <laughs> No, a naturalist is great. I think it's, you're right about having that community of people. I think it's really important. I also put a couple of links in the chat for that. All right, well, those were all of our questions. The rest are just comments about how inspired people feel, which is really good. Great. See, I <laughs> think we need some of that right now. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Karen, for your time. And thank you everyone for joining today. We really appreciate it. And we hope that you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you all. <laughs>